it seems very simplistic to say that men and women are different from each other. But society continues to argue that they are similar and even interchangeable. Tonight, we'll talk with a Catholic philosopher who has a few things to say on the subject, so please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Father Mitch Paco, and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. Now, our guest tonight has been a good friend of the network for many, many, many years, and she's here to talk about the role and mission of women and the lie of feminism. So please welcome Dr. Alice von Hildebrand. Dr. Alice. Let me ask you a question. When did you first come to EWTN? Father, you read my mind because I wanted to say so without you asking me. Uh -huh. I'm just celebrating the 24th anniversary of my first visit to EWTN. Is that, that right? That was in 88, and I met Mother Angelica, mm -hmm. and we had a very live, lively interchange precisely about my topic tonight. So. Let me see, to be here has been a privilege and has been a grace. And every time I leave, I'm grateful and I'm enriched. So I can simply say no. In the meantime, I've come much closer to eternal youth, mm -hmm. which means to say that most probably it's going to be my last show. And they call it the swan song. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was, I was just thinking, uh, you started here even after I did. Because I've been here now 28 years. 20, well, so you're ahead of me. A little bit. I thought that you were younger. Well, <laughs> you know. Well, appearance. Uh, I had, that's why this one lady was writing to me saying I'd dye my hair, you know. <laughs> well, I can tell you worse things than that. You know, <laughs> you know, for the last 25 years, I can say I've devoted my life to fighting feminism basically influenced by Cardinal Ratzinger, who said that feminism was one of the great dangers threatening the church today. The obvious reason is that God has given women such a crucial place in the church that they betrayed, the consequences are very serious. Now, I've given many talks on this, written quite a bit about it, and today I've decided to present it differently. Please. In other words, well, in other words, what I'm going to say today is not just a repeat of what you found previously. I'm going to speak about discrimination. Now, I claim that it's an absolutely fascinating topic. I came to the United States when I was in my late teens. I didn't know any English or just yes or no. And I learned English and I was told to discriminate means to make distinctions. You discriminate between good and evil, between beautiful and ugly, between intelligent and stupid, and you go on. And I understood it to be a compliment. If you're discriminating, you're intelligent. And if you don't discriminate, you're very foolish. As a matter but of fact, there's an expression to have discriminating to taste. That's it. It's a, it's a compliment. Yes. No, one of the problems about our language is that it keeps evolving. And this is why my husband said many times, in order for faith to be kept absolutely pure, we need a dead language, because the meaning no longer changes. You take discrimination. What happened about 40, 40, 45 years ago? It got another twist, another meaning, another nuance, and it actually mean an unjust judgment, unfair judgment on another person. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it was like an epidemic. 
and people started to discover they have been discriminated against. I'm quite convinced that you have been discriminated against. But the question is that the feminist movement got hold of discrimination and we're going to prove to the world that from the very beginning women have been discriminated against. And then came their champion, a famous woman, an intelligent woman, an intelligence which is not baptized by humility can be a disaster. And her name was Sivonne de Beauvoir. And she wrote this big fat book, 450 pages, called The Second Sex. Meaning to say that from the very, very beginning, in the Bible, Genesis, from the very beginning, the woman is treated as secondary, inferior, less talented, and so on and so on. Now, Chesterton is a great friend of man. I have a great admiration for him. And what I love about Chesterton is that he has a way of turning things upside down. And all of a sudden, by reading Simone de Beauvoir, once again, I said to him, I said, but my goodness, let us look at the Bible differently. And I came to a very tragic conclusion. I claim that men have been discriminated against in the Bible. Hmm. Now, that's news to you. Yes, it is. Well, I mean, therefore, you see, I say something that I've never been said before, and I'm going to become famous. Men have been discriminated against in the Bible. And I'm going to prove it to you. Of course, because you're a biblical scholar, I have to be very careful about my formulation, because I know what happens <laughs> when a Jesuit is a scholar, and you say something wrong, and he jumps on you. I'll be very careful. All right. All right. Everybody's warned. All right. Men in the audience, be ready for bad news. You're going to find out that you've been discriminated against from the very beginning. God creates Adam, and he makes his body from the slam of the earth. Is that a very aristocratic origin? No, it's very modest. Slam of the earth is not something particularly noble. Then he forms his body, and then he blows in his nostril and infiltrates a soul. In this very moment, Adam becomes a human person. Not an animal, a human person. And then, I'm going to go a little faster because in a television show you're given so little time that you have to concentrate things. Adam is lonesome. It's not good for man to be alone. And none of the animals was quiet to his measure. And so God decides to give him a companion. And what does he do? He puts him asleep. So Adam doesn't know what's going on at all. But one thing is certain, he takes Eve's body from Adam's body. And then there is Eve. And he wakes up and he sees her. And what is response? Enchantment. Blood of my birth, bone of my bone, and flesh of my Satan. One doesn't say whether she was enchanted with him. I think he was, but it's not stated in the Bible. But what is that's that? only because there's not a Hebrew word for that. I see. But if he were French, well, there, that's the word they'd comes, use. Then comes Father Papua, the scholar. No, I know nothing about Hebrew. So I mean, there you cannot go into a field that I know nothing about. That would be unfair. At any rate, let us think about it. Adam's body, slam of the earth. As I said, it's not very aristocratic. Eve's body, from the body of a human person. Now, had I been given a choice by God, what do you prefer to have your body made from the slime of the earth or from a human person? I said, for goodness sake, a human person. And that's we, women. Therefore, from the very beginning, we have given a tremendous advantage that we come from a human person. All right. And then, no, once again, I'm going to skip and don't tell me that this takes place before that. Adam gives Eve a title of nobility which is such that every time I read it, I'm overwhelmed. He calls her mother of the living. Now, in other words, Adam realizes there's a bond between woman and life, 
which is something overwhelming. That is a title of glory. Once again, I have to go fast. You know the tragedy of Cain, killing his brother Abel. He went when he was born. Eve said something amazing. She gives birth to Cain, and what does he say? With God's help, I brought a man into the world. Is Adam mentioned? No, totally overlooked. No, I thought that he also had something to say. But it's not even mentioned. And I said to myself, maybe unknowingly she was a budding theologian, <laughs> even though she never studied. Why a budding theologian? Because when the, fem the male seed penetrates into the female body, and then has a long, long, long trip through the Thalonian troop and fecund takes the egg. In this moment, you have a human person. Before that, you didn't have a human person. You have the human person, but this human person is formed in the body of a woman. The father is outside, completely and totally. And I claim now, Father, if I go off, I know that you'll jump on me, so I can say what I please. I'm ready. No, I know that. I know that you're a Jesuit. And at any rate, the semen and the egg, the semen penetrates it and fecundates it. In this moment, God creates a soul. Therefore, I claim God touches the female body by putting the soul in this semen, a fecundated egg. Now, when God touches your body, it makes it sacred. Once again, let me insist that this woman have this unbelievable dignity. Every time she conceives a child, that God touches her. This is why the female body is mysterious, this is where the female body has a dignity which is so extraordinary that it calls for veiling. And veiling is always a symbol of sacredness. You veil the tabernacle while Christ is present. You veil things that are blessed, that are special. And this is why veiling and woman belong together, which is something that we have totally, totally lost sight of, unfortunately. Take, for example, that up to Vatican II, women wore a veil in church. Now, a veil is once again a symbol of sacredness. And then some people, stupidly listening to the, to the feminists who said, well, she wears a veil, it's a sign of inferiority. It is a very opposite. And now they took it off and lost a sense of the mystery and dignity of women. Now, therefore, I'll give you several arguments to try to show that men have been discriminated against. Number one, the body from the slime of the earth. Number two, is not declared to be the father of the living. She is. And number three, when she gives birth to Cain, she says, with God's help, it's not mentioned. And I must say, had I been Adam, I would say, well, by the way, I mean, don't forget that all of us something to do, not even mention. Then Cain is killed by, Abel is killed by Cain. And then she reconceives Set, gives birth to Set, and repeats the very same word, thanks to God's help, I have brought a child into the world. Therefore, she was conscious of the dignity, the amazing dignity of women, the close collaboration with God. Now, you take Simone de Beauvoir. You know, unfortunately, as I said, she is very intelligent, and therefore it's easy for her to cheat people into believing certain things. And she simply said, a woman a second thought. She's an appendix, she's secondary. Well, Chesterton taught me to put things upside down and say, Father, what comes first? 
the rough draft or the copy or the original. Therefore, you can also say she came last because she's original and it's only a rough draft. That's one possibility of looking at it. But see, that's sort of a very negative view toward men there. Well, Father, you see I'm discriminating. I think so. You know, I certainly know I'm going to praise men later on. Don't you worry. I'm okay. not going to crush you. But nevertheless, I want to make the point that it is utter, complete nonsense to say that women have been discriminated against. I see the very opposite. Now you take another thing, which is, which is very interesting, that the very moment you start talking, if Simone de Beauvoir says, quoting Freud, poor little girls, they are born with an inferiority complex, which I personally don't know. Why? <laughs> because they realize that there's something missing in their anatomy. Can you imagine how dreadful you discover that there's something missing in your anatomy? Chesterton would put it upside down and would simply say, well, maybe there's something too much in your anatomy. That's also, also one way of looking at it. And on top of it, Father, I'll tell you something. It is quite true that male has an organ that females do not have. But on the other hand, what Simone de Beauvoir does not mention is that female have an organ that male do not have, and namely the womb. Now, the womb is the symbol, the cradle of life. And the fact that women have a womb gives them once again an extraordinary dignity because it means to see the place where life is going to be protected until birth. From this point of view, once again, let me insist. I wish I had the, I could speak like Demosthenes and Cicero combined, to make co women conscious of the fact that their body has such a beauty and dignity that they should be awed you continue and you go from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And there is one person alone who doesn't have original sin. And this person is a woman. And her name is Mary. And one very fine day, the angel Gabriel comes to her and offers her to become the mother of the Savior. And very chastely, very, he says, but I do not know man. What a lovely way of saying that she's a virgin. Today, the way that they use is so coarse that it makes you blush. I do not know her. And she's promised that the Holy Spirit will cover. And then she says, and the handmaid of the Lord, the most crucial words in the Bible. She declares herself to be the handmaid of the Lord. She declares herself to be willing to be fecundated by God once again. And in this moment, she conceives the savior of the world. Now, who is Christ? You know, you and I have a superficial knowledge. I mean, you have a deep knowledge and have a superficial knowledge of various religions, Hinduism and Buddhism and the Muslim and so forth and so on. I, I spent a couple of years, you know, to get some sort of knowledge. Nobody, nobody, not the Buddha, not Mohammed, none of them has ever declared, I am life and I am the truth. Christ alone. And of course, this is something which is so tremendous because if it is not true, it is the worst liar that has ever existed. I am the truth and I am the life. No, Mary conceives Christ. In other words, in this very moment, she conceives a being who is the way, the truth, and the life. Eve was called the mother of the living, but Mary gives birth to the one who says, I'm life itself. What does it mean, once again? 
that solemnly through Mary, we know that there is a sacred bond between the woman and life. Now, let me go back to Genesis. The serpent, who is very sly and very astute, addresses himself to Eve. My beloved St. Augustine, and I say beloved St. Augustine for me is one of the greatest luminaries in the history of the Church. And when I read his confessions at the age of 19, I say, you can't write something more beautiful than that. And St. Augustine says, because even very great minds can err, and he says, you know, he addressed himself to Eve because he was weaker, the weak sex, therefore easier to conquer. I dare criticize, I say, beloved St. Augustine, you're a genius and I'm not. But you're wrong. You are deadly wrong. The serpent addressed himself to Eve because being very clever. He knew that she had an enormous influence on Adam. And the very moment that she was conquered, he would follow suit, which is exactly what happened. She gives him the fruit, and he takes it. Does he say, my dear wife, you're prohibited to do so. Don't you see that you eat it? He doesn't see the first great wimp, and there are good <laughs> many in the history of the world. Now, in other words, one thing is absolutely certain. The woman is given a key role in the world. Not power, not authority influence. I'm not a disciple of Nietzsche. But you know, sometimes very bad people can see very good things when they're absent-minded. And Nietzsche said something very profound. He said, before the French Revolution and after the French Revolution, there is a radical change. After the French Revolution, the women had a lot more authority and much less influence. Think for one moment, what is more important, authority or influence? Authority can command actions. Influences changes your being. And in other words, I'm going to say the role of women is not to be secretary of state. It is not to be uh, speaker of the House. It is not to be Secretary of Education and God knows what. It to have a holy influence on their husband and on their children and therefore on the world. Why does Satan address himself to Eve? Why? Because she is the mother of the living. The serpent, Eve, the devil, hates life. Christ said he was a murderer from the beginning. Therefore, you have a murderer hating one being who is the mother of the living. Hence, the conflict between the devil and the woman. Man is a strong sex, and the woman is the one who is now the primary factor in the battle which is taking place. Father, I tell you something, at the end of my life, and I could shed tears. The very moment that a country legalizes abortion and says it's perfectly all right to murder your own child, it is the greatest victory of Satan since original sin. And therefore now we come at a crossroad and we proceed on this road. I can simply be we are leading to the destruction of the world, because we are waging war on life. Now you've been pretty silent, which is not quite in order. Maybe you can make a comment. <laughs> I'm afraid I may have to, because we're getting close to running out of time. Oh, I see. Uh, uh, but it's, um, you know, w one of the things that uh, I would add is that the great scene in Revelation 12 is where Satan, and, the great dragon, tries to fight, first of all, to consume the son who is life himself. Yes. 
and he is taken up to heaven. The battle then wages between him and the angels. And then when he's cast to earth, his battle is with the woman. And at that point, the earth protects the woman who's the mother of the Messiah. Yes. And, and she's protected, but uh, and ultimately defeats the evil one. But this is uh, something that for the rest of us, um, we have to pay close attention uh, because the battle continues. Unfortunately, time does not. So we're going to take a break. Uh, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. And we want to get your questions and your comments. So please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. First, all, I want to mention we have a nice big group of folks from a parish, St. Monica's over in Georgia, and a number of other individuals who have come here today. And we would love to have you come and join us as well. If you have an opportunity to be uh, in the area of Birmingham, Alabama, please come to our studios and be part of our programs and masses. Uh, you can contact uh, us at our pilgrimage department by calling 205-271-2966. That's 205-271-2966. Or you can also go to our website, www.ewtn.com, and they'll give you the schedule for the masses, the programs, uh, information about where you can stay and a variety of other things that you might need to know. Uh, and we'd be happy to have you come here and be part of our family in the live audience. Well, let's start off with a question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Atlanta. Great. Good to have you here. Originally Cincinnati. Great. Another nice town. Oh, thank you. It is. Uh, taught there for a couple of years. Uh, what's your question? Uh, I was raised in a family of 10 children where the woman is the homemaker, stays home and raises her children, and they get all the basic foundations and their spiritual background through the mother. She's, my mother was always home, and now the role is changing, and so many of these women are the career women, and they're gone all day, and the men are the, the homemakers. And I just feel like uh, it's causing problems. Mm -hmm. I think it's difficult because I think the mother has the children, and it's natural for them to be home with them. Mm -hmm. So in my own family, I see that where, you know, the women are out and they're the big jobs and a role model and the husband is there part of the time. And I think it's difficult. And I wonder her opinion on that. You want to respond to that? Father, I told you that you've got to translate the question. Okay, me, so, so the, this lady is talking about a number of people she knows where uh, instead of what happened in the past where a mom stayed home and raise the children. Now the mom goes to work and sometimes the father stays home. Or in some cases too, sometimes both parents are out to work and children are in daycare and things. So do you have any comments about you know, this, uh, the removal of women from the home? Father, you know, I do believe 
that when a woman has the privilege of having a child, to take care of that child is or should be her primary concern and her primary joy. I mean, don't forget, I mean, this is something that is almost funny. Men, one of the things that they lack is a breast. So they cannot breastfeed a child. Well, uh, we, we lack a useful one. <laughs> well, that there's nothing like breastfeeding because there's a contact between the child and the mother which is of such depth and such beauty. And this is something that men cannot do. You know, men have plenty of qualities, but when it comes to breastfeeding, they are plainly inferior. They can't Absolutely. do it. Absolutely. We just know the case of Mardocky, you know, in, uh, who had breast to feed Esther. You know, recall in the Old Testament, and you know, because she had lost her parents, and then miraculously, her uncle grew breasts. But I mean, that's a very special case, and I don't think that most men would appreciate it. I simply say this is something that God has arranged. No, look, the tragic situations in which a woman is forced to work, but it must be a sacrifice. But to believe that to be, you know, to be, to, to be doing work when you neglect your family and the children do not get the loving attention is simply to betray their mission. No, I'm going to put it differently. I had a very, very good Catholic education because when I was a child, the nuns were truly Catholic nuns. And I can only tell you, when you go to school for 12 years and you have six hours of religious instruction per week, you know something about your faith. So I was five years old and I go to school and I'm told about Adam. Eve says it is a fault of the serpent, and Adam says it is a fault of Eve. And I was beside myself. Now, the nuns discouraged us to raising questions. We have to be receptive, which was a very good point. And I said to myself, I still recall, my dad would not do that. He's a gentleman. And so I had a strong dislike for Adam because I thought he was a coward. He said, it's her fault. I mean, I thought it was. No, I go further and I read about Esau, you know, Esau and Jacob. And he goes to the field and then comes back and his brother had made a mess of pottage and he was hungry and he makes a deal that he's going to sell his birthright for a mess of pottage. I was five or six and I said to myself, I would not be that stupid. <laughs> this is something that I would never do. Now today, we have created a society of female Esau's. And I mean, they are selling their birthright of giving life and caring for a child and giving love, which somebody can replace, for the sake of working for, I don't know, whatever it please. I mean, it's madness. You see, the very moment that you lose sight of the hierarchy of value, Father, you see, to sell your birthright for a mess of pottage is stupid. But to give up, so to speak, maternity for the sake of being Secretary of State, I mean, it is insanity. It is something so shameful and so abominable. And you know, I'm going to say to you something strange. We live in a society which is very sick. And you know, sometimes I say to myself, I'm very fortunate that I'm so old because what is coming might not be nice, particularly because the relationship between men and women is so disrupted that I believe this explains to a large extent the terrible thing called homosexuality. Terrible thing called, because I mean, this is such a fundamental distortion, totally overlooking the fact that men and women complement each other. And we live in a society which is so materialistic that when you think about sexuality, we think about the biological sphere. In fact, Father, and this is something that I try to show in my book, that sexuality, male and female, starts from a religious point of view a spiritual point of view, an intellectual point of view, an affective point of view, a human point of view, a social point of view. Men and women complement each other. And the very moment that you, disc you have unisex, 
Unisex is going to be the death of our society because to claim that there's no difference between men and women inevitably leads to same-sex marriage, which was one of the greatest abominations in the history of the world, because it simply means to say there is no difference between man and woman. But I mean, there is because God has said he made them male and female, meaning to say two beings that are admirably made for each other and complement each other. You see, just imagine in a society where homosexual marriage are approved by the President of the United States and claims that he has the endorsement of Christ, we are badly off. And if we turn, change course, I think we are heading for a catastrophe. Now, you see, if you, you are proof of same-sex marriage, when well, you, know you do, you are married to death. Because imagine, these same-sex marriages, they cannot have children, they can have a prejudice. It doesn't matter. We can have fun together. We can enjoy one another. The situation is so grave that I wish, I mean, this is what Cardinal Gandolin is doing, to fight and say we cannot give up one inch on these issues, otherwise we are lost. All right, let's go to a caller. We have Tony on the line. Hello, Tony. Well, I mean, this is not a uh, no. Tony, where are you from? I'm from Rhode Island. Uh, great, and what's your question? Question is a philosophical one for uh, Dr. Van Hildebrand. Um, are there any metaphysical or ontological differences between man and woman that go beyond uh, biological gender? Did you hear? Well, I mean, you know, obviously, uh, you can see that a man's mind and a woman's mind are admirable things, but they have a different approach to things. Now, let me just give you an example, which I borrow from St. Edith Stein. She gave once a talk in Salzburg in 1930, and the point that she was trying to make precisely to show that spiritually and intellectually and affectively, women and men are different. It doesn't mean better or worse, it means simply complementary. Now, she mentions three things which are quite crucial. She says that by her very nature, women are more attracted to what is personal than to what impersonal. And it is, to my mind, the greatness of women. You know, I can take a very simple example. Suppose, for example, that you have a group of men and women standing in front of a closed door. And when the door is open, there's a room and there are only two things, a brand new computer and a baby in a cradle. Now, if a woman is worthy to be called a woman, she will go to the cradle and take care of the baby. And men will see a oh, baby and then turn. You know that computer, <laughs> mad. I mean, this is something that I cannot understand. You give them a computer and they're gone for hours and playing with it and so on, and so, as if it was simply will. The relationship between a woman and person is something so seen because she's related to life. She says another thing which is very interesting, which is very profound. She says, men are attracted by abstractions. Women are attracted by the concrete. This is why a man would write a long treatise on education, and a woman will be concerned about the education of this child, which happens to be very different from another child. You see, when they love theories, and this is why Chesterton says, men go up and up and up, and unless they have a wise woman who brings them back on earth, they're going to end in madness, because they fly away from the concrete. She says further, the structure of a woman's life, mind, is directed towards the individual, not generalities. Now, this is why men have been creature of science. I mean, after all, one of the arguments of Simone de Beauvoir, men have been creators. Women have no Homer, and no Dante, and no Shakespeare, and no Beethoven, therefore they're inferior. And she draws a conclusion, women produce nothing. That's what she dares say. 
and that a woman brings a child into the world, that's nothing. But, Father, you know the second epistle of St. Peter. It's not a very cheerful one. There are beautiful things in it, but there are some that are very, very fearful. And he said, at the end of time, the world will be destroyed by a fire that will ruin everything. You see the beautiful St. Peter in Rome. You see the Dome of Florence. You see the Cathedral of Chartres. You see magnificent monuments. You see paintings. You see sculptures. All the works of men. Men, men, men. Women, nothing. It will all be dust and ashes. But every child to whom a woman has given life lives for eternity. Therefore, you see the abomination, the sort of big lie that feminists present. Instead of praising and singing God's glory, that we give birth to a child with an immortal soul. Now, this is, of course, a sign of dignity that women today have lost sight of. And this is why you take Europe dying because they have no children. You know, one and a half child and so forth. And then, of course, thank God you have South America and you have Africa. And I mean, these people still produce children, but we don't because it's a burden. It prevents your fulfillment or your creativity. I see that infinitely worse than Esau. Esau was a fool, but we are criminals. You know, one, one of the other things too, that I, I think are very, uh, in, there's some very interesting aspects of the differences between men and women. One of them is that right when the brain is being formed, there, uh, th there's a, a flush of testosterone that comes from the mother over the, uh, the newly conceived child. And this has no effect on a girl baby. But on a boy baby, it begins, it, it causes some divisions in the brain. And, and men begin to think differently. Uh, it's, it's in the structure of the brain. And there are a number of ways in which this shows up so that by age four months, you already see girl babies are much more interested in communicating back and forth with other individuals. And as they grow up, little girls will play with dolls and stuffed animals and so on, and carry on conversations for all of them. Yeah. Little boys don't do that. Most of the time, when we play as little boys, we make noises. <laughs> We're bombs, trucks, Planes. I don't you know, think that. Uh, we, we, so we don't want you to play with our stuff then. <laughs> you don't have to. You play with your dolls, we'll play with our toys. But we, and and it's, it, it indicates some of the different way in which men and women are. And this is not culture. You're not, boys don't have to be told to do this. They do, you, don't, you don't have to tell a boy that you take a stick and try to shoot it as a gun. Boys do it all over the world. And they pick up a stick and they got a sword. You know, this is uh, something that is just the way boys are. And you don't have to tell little girls to play with dolls. They, they, they just are gravitate toward it. And this gets at some of the ways that men deal with task orientation. And women have that interpersonal quality. That's good. Yes. And, you know, it, and it, again, it shows up from early infancy, all through childhood, and then into adulthood, it shows up in this way. The average man speaks 12,000 words a day. That's about average. The average woman speaks 26,000 words a day. Are all 26,000 necessary? This is the, <laughs> you ask the ladies. We have, speaking of ladies, we have another question from our studio audience. Well, Sister, where are you from? A, what I you am she's my close friend. originally from New York, and I have had the joy of knowing our guest for even more years than she's known EWTN. Oh, and great. 
So even after college, I brought my friends to visit her to hear things like we're hearing tonight. So this is just a joy to see her. And I want to ask how, for those of us that aren't as eloquent, um, how can we communicate um, in a world that's, the, the terms have been pre-opted, we'll say, and people um, are to some extent brainwashed by a, a feminist, radical feminist agenda. How can we help um, women rediscover the feminine mystique, I'd say, the true feminine mystique? Do you understand? No. In other words, in, in a society where feminism has so much influence, what can a person, the, the average person, do to help women regain that feminine quality that the feminists try to eliminate? Rage and joy. The message of joy, because, I mean, these feminists, if you look at them, they're tense. You know, somehow all the beauty and the sweetness of femininity is gone. You know, I do believe that my husband was right. The greatest apostolate is the apostolate of being. Not what you say, not what you preach, but what you are. And if you read it, you see a mother, you know, nursing her child, radiant, because she knows that feeding life. This is a message that will carry. No, Father, you know, I'm very much afraid that people will leave the place in that some, so to speak, I do not see enough the greatness of a man's mind. I mean, don't forget my whole career, my whole life has been so formed by my husband. But one thing is absolutely certain between the male man and the female man, they're complementary. And he was a giant and I was a dwarf on his shoulder. But from time to time, when I was reading his manuscripts and raising a question, and a typically feminine question, forcing him to be more concrete or more explicit on certain things. You know, that was my role, but I was very conscious. I mean, I've been blessed in life by meeting men worthy to be called men. Now, let me tell you something, and I would like to speak to millions of audience. I would like to say to men and to young fathers, don't forget the first image that your daughter will have is you. And if you live up to your dignity as father, you know, as protector, as loving, as encouraging, as chivalrous, this image will remain. That was a blessing of my life with my father and later with my husband. I know little girls that have been abused at the age of four and five. And the image of man is so abominable that only God's grace can heal them because of this brutality, this animal brutality. Now, another thing which is very important, the affective life of men and women is very different. And I don't think you will disagree with me when I say that for women, there is a closer union between mind and heart. For men, sometimes they're much more separated. You know, look, when you turn to electronics, your heart is not involved. In everything that a woman does, her heart is involved. And it seems to me that one of the great things that a woman can give to a man is to teach him not to be ashamed of his noble feelings. You know, I, men, I know men who make terrible scenes and scream and shout and get mad. But the moment it comes, they are touched, they hide, because they don't want to show tears. They feel defeated. And you know, this is a great mission of women to awaken the affectivity, and simultaneously for men to teach some women who need it very badly to control their affectivity, because it, then it falls into sentimentality, which is an abominable caricature of true affectivity. So I mean, at the end of my life, I simply say, that God has invented man and woman is so beautiful that I call it a divine invention. They need one another. Father, why is it that if you take great religious orders, you have the male saint and the female saint, Saint Francis and Saint Claire, Saint Jean-Francois de Chantal and Saint Francis of Sales, 
sent uh, you know all of them there is somehow a woman who complements the works understands their works deepens their works encourages them saint jerome you recall how he's encouraged by i forgot the name of the lady you know delhi and also her daughter who came and were translator or helping you to translate and they were women of discouragement and the women don't no, continue your work you have a great mission so God's plan is magnificent and we have ruined it and I do believe a great deal of the responsibility is simply because women who have a key role have lost sense of it. Now look, I have a quotation of St. Ambrose and I brought it because it's so beautiful. He says, in the distribution of divine gifts, God has given women a first place. That's St. Ambrose. You take one of the uh, Oratio, I believe it's in September or in God who has given salvation in the hands of a woman, the Holy Virgin. And then feminists dare to say that God has looked down on women as being secondary. They have a key role. And I have the feeling the main, most important thing today is for women to rediscover the beauty of their mission. And then men will follow suit. Let's uh, go to one more call, I think. Uh, Jason, you on the line? Yes. Hi, where are you from? I'm from Fort Myers, Florida. Great. And what's your question? Dr. von Hildebrand, I was hoping that you could elaborate upon what exactly the scandal of contemporary feminism is. So, uh, so in other words, he would like you to expand a little bit on the scandal of contemporary feminism. I repeat, it is the greatest victory that Satan has achieved since original sin to make women lose sight of their dignity, of their mission, of their beauty, of the greatness of collaborating with God and giving life. And I mean, in other words, what we have to try to do is to raise an education of young girls so conscious of this beauty, so conscious of the mystery of femininity, to discourage them for being dressed in a fashion which is, shows that they do not respect the mystery of their body. You know, Father, I cannot tell you how grateful I am at the end of my life that through my education I was always conscious of the fact that my body was something sacred. And then you respect it. And because you respect it, men respect it. Because, you know, men are extremely intuitive. And when they found out that a girl has no respect for her own body, they will abuse her. Yes. They will use her as an instrument, but if they know She's conscious of the fact there's a mystery in me. There's a bond between myself and life. They feel it. And I mean, I believe this is where we have to begin with prayer. Prayer, prayer, and devotion to the Holy Virgin. Yeah. And I think, you know, w one of the things that is going to be mutually important is for men to have the same sense of their own dignity yes. as well. Absolutely. You know, that uh, as men and women, you know, realize that uh, what Pope John Paul the Great constantly brought out is that the dignity of each person is something that flows from the life of the Trinity, where each of the divine persons has inherent dignity sure. and at the same time unity. And, you know, this is something that uh, we very much need to have today uh, uh, um, between men and women. One of the things that uh, I'm afraid, though, is that we've run out of time well, Father, for the evening. This is what happens on television. I know. It. And they're very insistent on bringing it to a close. It's not like the old days with Mother. She would keep going if she wanted, but we can't do that anymore. I want to thank you for being with us again. And you said maybe this is your last time. Maybe not. We'll see. Well, all we'll, things, we'll all leave that up are, to God. No, Father, all things are possible with God. Exactly. So let me give you all a blessing. May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. 
and lead you in all of your ways by his peace, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And you know, we've been able to bring you Dr. Alice von Hildebrand for the last 24 years and so many other great guests because this network is brought to you by you. She's remained so much part of our EWTN family and you are too. But we need your support. So we ask you to please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. And we'll be able to pay all of our bills too. Thank you and God bless. We don't know.